Welcome back to Future Fast, and uh, once again we have a very uh, special guest. And uh, before I introduce our guest, uh, Tom Pickering, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, this uh, Future Fast is an effort to bring people who are doing things, who are working on things, which are bound to have an impact on the future. And uh, the idea of these conversations are to try to understand what are they doing, how do they see the future, how are they preparing for it, and what are they. Uh, what are the things or the flags that if if they identify something and uh, possibly we can take a cue for uh, or a tip perhaps for our own businesses and life and see how we can uh, look at it and uh, essentially better prepare for the kind of future that uh, we are going into and uh, and also there will be uh, some uh, near long term uh, predictions as well and uh, uh, the whole idea is to get uh, more people to start thinking about the future. So, having said that, we will uh, get down to uh, bringing uh, uh, our guest uh, today. So, Tom Pickering is a, a multi uh, multi faceted uh, personality. Uh, he's uh, 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 he's uh, uh, a zero carbon champion, if uh, if I can put that. And uh, he's been uh, consulting. He's been uh, advising. Uh, a lot of businesses. He's been a turnaround specialist uh, for a fairly long time. And uh, personally, he's been a cycling enthusiast. He also has a business. Perhaps we'll also talk about that. I get him to talk about it in the course of it. And uh, uh, he is also part of a uh, fund, which is uh, essentially to encourage uh, zero carbon initiatives. And uh, we'll uh, perhaps also talk about that. And uh, uh, he's a person, he's one of the voices that I thought uh, we should uh, uh, bring and perhaps uh, get more people to uh, hear. And uh, that's why, uh, uh, you know, we have Tom. And Tom, thank you so much for making time to do this with us and uh, being here. Welcome to Future Fast. So in terms of the relevance of my experience to this particular situation, I've written five books. One is The um, the Evil of Silence. So a lot of dialogue, mm. if you take the you know, the ideology around electric vehicles, I say electric right. vehicles are bad, you say electric vehicles are good. You know, Then you've got this sort of conflict of ideology. There's a lot of that going on. And there's a lot of people are not taking a broad view or actually encouraging that debate to come up with a better solution. So... Our ability to speak up is absolutely vital, and also, yeah. Well, um, uh, uh, in India context, I'm uh, I, I question electric vehicles because we just don't have the uh, infrastructure. One, we don't make the batteries, so we are importing. So the same question, what you brought about the three hundred and sixty degree yeah, aspect, yeah. And two, we don't have the infrastructure to address the afterlife of a battery. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. from an India context. So there are two facilities coming up. So the argument people make is that uh, as things pick up, infrastructure will also develop. Yeah. So and no one's looking so, at that, and that's a massive cost, which makes oh, it... it is a cost, but uh, it also is a demand. Then you know, uh, see uh, now we have a lot of economy cars to premium cars driving with uh, yeah, uh, uh, which are uh, powered by electric. Uh, batteries right so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, these battery lives are typically eight to ten years at best yeah so they're all just being sold for the last two years so yes. we still have a little bit of a window before they have to be looked at from a point of purpose, repurposing yeah so so the numbers will get big so i think essentially economic has to drive all the adoptions yeah well the econ if well if you look at the economics you wouldn't if you look at the economics you would not invest in electric vehicles you would not can we still go with the fossil fuels then? Yes, we we should still have some fossil fuels. Yeah, absolutely. 
uh, the pure pure electric vehicle strategy is, in my view, unaffordable. When you look at the overall costs, people will not be able to afford it, and we cannot afford the infrastructure costs. It's not, and I I can send you some analysis on that, but it's see, unaffordable. Uh, in India, it's kind of, see you know what is the cheapest uh, electric vehicle in India? Uh, Scooter. It's no no uh, not the two wheeler. Of course, we have two wheelers which have become yeah. way cheaper. Uh, but an electric car, uh, uh, it's it's about eight lakhs. So how much would that be? That's about hundred thousand dollars. Hundred thousand dollars. Yes. Hundred thousand dollars. It's quite a lot of money, isn't it? No, no, no. Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars. Yeah. 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 And so I think it, it's not just the vehicle, right? It's the it's the overall picture. It's the recycling of the battery. It's the um, the cost of running that versus um, uh, fossil fuels and it has to oh, be affordable. Yeah, see, right now these are not in the equation right right now the government or the brand or the people are not thinking of where they came from the source is not looked at i, I, I get your point if you look at a 360 degree view that's the ideal way right but can we take people towards that well when i look at a situation you you ask me right you ask me uh what do i say to technology entrepreneurs Right. Yeah, uh, I would say I've done the I've done the top level analysis on this. If I was going to invest in an electric vehicle business to do, I would say don't do it, right? Because it's unaffordable and nobody and nobody is you no, know, it just makes no economic sense. And in fact, it'll make things a lot worse because we'll all become very poor, we'll not be able to afford them, and we'll have no money to fix the planet, right? That's the that's the that's in a really simple summary, that's that's the sort of reality of electric vehicles but they do play a part they do play a part in an overall picture and this is the right. danger of ideology okay so um it's very important we have balanced discussions around this stuff so that's around the silence inside of this the other side is the menticide so there's actually menticide here um do you know what menticide is no it's when it's when people talk about electric vehicles so much that you stop right. talking about the, the your concerns, right? Um, so you, it becomes overwhelming. Okay, that the mantra of electric vehicles of the future, they're going to save the planet. There's no emissions. No, it's a it's all nonsense because there are no emissions. Of course, there are emissions. The emissions are in China coming out of a coal fired power plant. That's where the emissions are. And actually, if that's you take true. That, that's true. If you take that, if you take that ten thousand dollar car actually what's the actual cost of that how how sustainable is that you know I, the battery will probably coming out of china um etc etc so there's well no, yes actually apart from battery everything else is built in india so yeah. battery is coming from china and that's because basically a car electric that's vehicle, starter motors i think i don't know if they're selling cars in uk as well what who's that sorry tata motors yeah, Tata. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, no, Tata is a smart company. I like Tata. Um, yeah, they, well, they they own uh, Jaguar Land Rover, I think, still. Correct. Um, Correct. But um, so I think if you look, I mean, because basic electric vehicles are battery on wheels. There's nothing else to it. Uh, it's a very simple device. The other problem with electric vehicle is because it's simple, there's very little differentiation. So it's a race to the bottom as well. Um, there's very little way to differentiate your electric vehicle versus anybody else's. And with a petrol vehicle. I, I'm curious. So what is the alternate? Are you saying just stick with the fossil fuel? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. Till no. How long? I'm just saying that each country has its own individual strategy that fossil fuels should play a part of, including heavy heavy goods vehicles as well. Um, and actually, marine is a big issue as well. Marine, I've discovered marine is a large polluter uh, that needs to be addressed. So... We need to reduce emissions, but there's a way of doing that without trashing our economies, Nanju. At the moment, we're going to trash our economies. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. um, right. The other, the in terms of my books, the other one is why can't we stop? So we've touched a bit on this about why can't we stop because of you know, the the echo chambers. So who do you speak mm -hmm. to? Who's challenging your thinking? Yeah, who's challenging yeah. my thinking? Well, most people tend to 
create people around them who don't challenge them. Let's exactly. Get to be a peaceful environment. We exactly. both agree with each other and we like each other's company. Exactly. And that's and that's unfortunately not we've got some difficult problems to fix. And actually you cannot fix difficult problems like that. Um and the other one is why can't we get out of the bubble? So why can't we stop and why can't we break out of this? Um and then you've got the pathology of technology, which is how does technology fuel this? So there's no, but in some okay. senses, technology helps you break out of this uh this situation right i mean at least you're exposed to new thoughts uh new ideas um well I, it I, I, you... I mean different from your echo chambers that you yeah i'm organically... talking about the psychology of the tech so i'm talking about the communication and the way um the communication on social media for example um tends to gravitate oh, towards... yeah there also okay. you tend to get into the echo chambers yeah. too and you, you, and so that's what that's the sort of technology i'm talking well, about is it difficult to break out of it yeah it's almost well you're addicted um addiction right um you need to legis in my view addiction is a really big problem because the definition do you know what the definition of addiction is oh, please go ahead it's when you lose control of your of some of yourself right and so the most mm. obvious example is heroin addiction or alcohol addiction which is typically a, a serious medical condition and yet the level of addiction to technology and social media and this, no, not this type of input, but the sort of input when we get up, get off this call and start doing whatever we're doing in our echo right. chambers, that, that is, is unbelievably addictive and we ought to, it ought to be regulated. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, and I think the other thing is as well, when, when it, when I look at, you asked about when I look at companies, what do I think, you know, the first question really is, is it compelling? Does it add any value? Um, or is it just trashing a business, another business model? And uh, and also, there are some good businesses that um, their source of revenue is not directly related to um, what they're good at doing. OK, so, for example, there's a business called um, Starling Bank, which actually has quite an inv uh, most fintech businesses. I don't I think they're a waste of time, but. Styling Bank is actually quite good, but their main sort of revenue is not the value adding services. It's it was based upon interest rates. Right. So they were giving away most of their services and they're making the money on interest rates, which, of course, for the last X amount of years has caused them a huge problem. So mm. it's very important that your profitability is linked to your core values. So if you want to sell something to me, Nanju, or I want to sell something to you, then it mm. has to be. You know, the price of that has to be related to what I'm good at doing or what I'm selling as opposed to something else. If I said... Oh, uh, Tom, uh, let me just give you a quick uh, thing about one of the things I'm doing, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I think, Like I, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, I'm in the blockchain business and one of the things we're doing is uh, also we got into blockchain training uh, because when we got started uh, two and a half years ago, we had very less, almost three years ago, very less resource in blockchain. So we thought we need to develop more blockchain resource. Yeah. So we uh, we uh, thought we should ideally give the course free because we looked up, there were a lot of, a few people who were offering blockchain courses. They were very expensive. Yeah. We thought at that cost, there'll be very few people who will be getting into blockchain. Yeah. So we thought we should do it free. But if we have to do it free, somebody has to pay for it. Yeah. So what we did, we reached out to a blockchain technology company yeah. and said, we will build a developer community for you. Yeah. So you pay us so much. And we designed this program and we deliver it to the students across hundreds of engineering colleges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did that. We signed up. It was a good money. They also agreed. So it was also money and it was also we were achieving what we wanted to do, creating resources. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, last year, you know, the Ukraine war started and, uh, you know, the blockchain technology companies don't pay you in dollars or pounds. They pay you in um, crypto, their own coins. Uh, right, okay. Right, and we have to exchange it to dollars or rupees, whatever. Yeah. So we agreed on certain dollar value and we got started. We received a very small advance because they said they will pay at this stage. Yeah. Right? So we got started with the work and uh, the war started, the Ukraine war started, right. Ukraine-Russia war, and uh, then America, uh, I mean, you know, the 
conversation started happening that Russia will start using uh, crypto and Bitcoin and all, and the yeah. Bitcoin fell, crypto fell. Yeah. So you know uh, the dollar value of our agreement from their crypto value, what we were getting paid out of, it fell almost to one fourth of the price what we uh, from wow. our dollar value at the time of signing. Yeah. So yeah. they had to pay four times the price to us. Yeah. Wow. From their point of view. Yeah. Yeah. So they stopped the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, effectively, they we didn't we could not even get through with our invoices that we had already raised. Yeah. So uh, uh, almost uh, two hundred thousand dollars just went out of thin air for me. Yeah. Right. So we developed these things. We got started, and everything stopped. So now I have a training program. I don't want to charge. Yeah. And we continue to do it. So many of my friends said that don't do it. Stop it here. Yeah. Why do you want to take the work? But the rest of the need is same. We still need resources. So we continue to build training programs. Yeah. And uh, we thought first we will go directly to colleges and offer at a very small price. Yeah. We didn't take, we didn't get takers for it. So finally, what we are doing now is we are putting the whole program free. Okay. So you do the course, you get it free, you take the certificate. We have a product called VeriChain, which is a verification tool. Yeah. So wherever you apply for a job, you need to verify. Or the employer has to verify whether your certificate is genuine. Right. There, you got to pay for it. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, I know. Yeah. Uh, so I think, sometimes we have to come around things. Sometimes yeah. you just can't make money out of what you do. Yeah. I, mean, I think if I was if I was looking at that, I mean, one, I'm really concerned about cryptocurrency and its value. I don't think cryptocurrency actually has any value um, per se. So that contract would would have really concerned me. Um, I guess the the other side of that is it's actually Jeff Bezos that actually says um, that your source of profit is what's difficult to replicate. So in that situation, I'd imagine your program would be top notch. But when you what's difficult to replicate is not the u- unique selling proposition because some USPs can be very simple to replicate. Um, and actually, if you if if it's not difficult, to, if it is dip, difficult to replicate, so I guess there's something about your service and your program, and your ability to bespoke it to the clients, which is very special. And I think um, if people are in a situation where they're giving away their core business, and so I challenge you on that, Nanju, if I may, that you know if you're you could be giving away your core business there, albeit your source of revenue, it might be a uh, because when I, when I ever do business with anybody, I always charge the money up front, right? Because that qualifies the relationship, but it and it professionalizes that relationship before I do anything whatsoever. Um, so I'm always very concerned about um, giving away th- things free of charge. And I've seen a lot of businesses create a precedent, like you just described. It's very difficult to go back and sell your courses if you've given them away. And so well, I. Uh... I, I agree. I don't think I can ever go back and charge a fee for it unless right now what this whole thing is free if it is done online. Yeah. If you want me to send my people to physically send to your space, place, yeah. and do a physical training, that, that's at a premium price. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because and I, and I this think is free. For me, it's all pre-recorded, so it's a one-time cost. Yeah. And I think so, yeah, I agree. I think the the difficulty with this as well. I mean, if you take a lot, you know, some of the banking models, they're fueled upon generating a lot of customers <clears throat> by giving away a lot of free services and trashing their own markets. And then what mm-hmm. happens is another competitor comes in. I mean, there's companies like Revolut and Monzo who operate in this sort of space and Starling Bank. And there's a and then they start and they can't charge because somebody else will come in behind and give away no, that. Uh, service. See, uh, my, my need here is that I'm not. See, I didn't start this training to make money out of it, essentially. We needed okay. to do this because we need to create more. See, blockchain is not just cryptocurrency. No, no. Right? Blockchain is yeah, I agree. Has That's actually, a huge yeah. impact, and there is so much more out of it. And we need quality resource coming out of it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, there is a good opportunity for us to create more jobs out of here in blockchain because we actually have 50% of the population is below 35. Yeah, yeah. We don't have enough jobs happening. Yeah, but I guess and 
Yeah, okay. That Today, internet is everywhere. People can sit in any remote place. They don't have to come to Bangalore or Bombay or Delhi to get a job. They can sit in their own rem- hometowns, villages, or small town. Yeah, they can be in. On internet, because today one good thing is in uh, in India, infrastructures have improved significantly. Good roads, yeah, connectivity, telephone connectivity, internet, yeah. So people can pretty much sit and work out of anywhere. Yeah, I guess the just come back to that point. Maybe if you, I mean, if if companies find themselves giving away services, they've got to challenge themselves. What is their core business, and what's difficult to replicate? How can they make money in the future? Because I think this is one yeah. of the this is one of the problems. Yeah, the core of my business would be obviously building products and applications in the blockchain. Yeah, so for right. me, I'll get resources out of here. Yeah, yeah. So the idea of, so this is not the core from a point of business. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, 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 got it. Um, so, and I think um, there's some psychology that sits behind that as well, which is <clears throat> certainly in the UK, there's a sort of pump and dump mentality to grow these businesses Feel their feel their valuations um, without ever really oh, uh, any sign. We of have making. biggest of Indian brands have actually done that. You must be familiar with Reliance. With which one? Reliance. Reliance. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard about that one. Yeah, they they are one of the biggest. I think uh, uh, he's uh, the the chairman of Reliance Group is probably the third richest man in the world. Yes, a fourth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Modi, uh, uh, what's his name? Ambani, uh, Mukesh Ambani. You must be familiar with him. Yeah, yeah. No, I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, so so I think uh, they actually did what you said, pump and dump, right? They flooded the market at the lowest yeah. cost. Yeah. So there was no going back from there. Yeah. So I think that, you know, again, coming back to what does good look like, I think it's very important that the two references I think that leaders should operate around is profit and relationships. Profit. If you can make a profit, it's sanity, Nanju. It's sanity. It's the only thing. How on earth can you do due diligence on a company if it doesn't make a profit? Or, and I think the other side of that is beware of people that are going to make profit in the future, because I think businesses should make a profit from the start. Um, largely, when you've got something, if you can, you should always be able to sell it to someone for a profit. Um, and there are a lot of people talking who are scaling broken business models where they're scaling um, something that's never going to make a profit. And, and and definitely Revolut is one of those where the transactional costs are greater than the revenue. They've just been making increasing losses. Well, I agree with you, Tom, on that. I'm also part of many startup ecosystem. We talk about it to startups that you need to be focused on profits. But uh, don't you think historically, if you look at it, uh, uh, I, I remember we were, I was in a business of consulting on setting up a virtual private network that very VSAT, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that very small aperture terminal for uh, satellite connection to establish a, a virtual private network. Of course, yeah, uh, this was before the terminology of VPN because VPN happened post two thousand. That this was in the nineties, so we used to call intranet with the internet a VSAT as a backbone. But yeah. uh, those days, we used to talk about a return on investment is over the next five years, seven years, or 10 years, depending on the size of your business. Yeah, yeah. And it was accepted, right? There were a lot of investments, like even uh, mobile companies, when they came in putting up towers, it was talked about that the return, on, this is over 15 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so many, infra- in fact, even the uh, nuclear power plants, right? This is yeah. going to be over 65 years to make uh, profits out of a power plant. Yeah. So, so uh, wh- why is it uh, that suddenly we want immediate profits? Uh, well, it's sanity. It's because um, it's sanity. See, some I... businesses, yes, profit at a unit level. But some businesses, you need to have a long tail, right? It's only fair because that yeah, yeah. kind of infrastructure, that whole oh, approach yeah, demands, capital, it, right? So, yeah, um, but I guess it, you know, coming back to the... Um, electric vehicle situation if you look at the total in infrastructure investment costs right as a, right. as a as a total of the efficiency of electric vehicles the zero carbon aspects the energy consumption of them etc cetera, etc cetera, you wouldn't do it you wouldn't do it right and so um because right um the return on capital well it's 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 basically loss it's it's loss making um and people will not be able to afford it. 
But of course, if you have a power station or if you're going to build a you know, long term investment, I mean, this um, water power project I'm working with at the moment, um, it's a two point five billion pound project. Um, OK. And of course, it's not going to make a profit on day one. Right. Um, but that there's a very clear, you know, there's two customers for the power that have been secured already. Uh, there's a very clear environmental aspect to it, very positive, very good for the community, generates a lot of work. It does all of those things mm -hmm. on the top seven. That's a sustainable business. And the, then the mm -hmm. question is, how can you de deliver that program, which is going to take five years to deliver? And who are the partners you're going to work with to achieve that? Um, so, of course, there is, you know, but it's about, you know, managing each stage of those projects. And I think when you look at it at the right level of detail, you can see that, yes, that's going to work. If you've got the right team around it, right experience. I think when you look at a lot of these technology projects, um, they're actually trashing their own market or they haven't got sufficient. <clears throat> what they're doing is not sufficiently difficult to replicate so that somebody else can come in behind them and kill them. Uh, or an electric vehicle is the same. Um, and that unfortunately plays to because there's not much differentiation with electric vehicle. It's a battery on wheels largely. Um, and in fact, I think it's it's quite interesting, actually, because I launched Kodak into Europe, um, Kodak Digital into Europe, which is an um, unmitigated disaster. If you ever look at um, that 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 project, and it's because the branding was was wrong, because Kodak were a premium brand, but they were never associated with digital. And the the players who operated in that space um, were utilit utilitarian Tesla type companies. Mm -hmm. They weren't premium type companies. So when you went to go and buy the products, you would not look for Kodak and it never sold Nanju. And I think we've got the same issue with electric vehicles. I think um, the upmarket, perceived upmarket value of a BMW or a Mercedes will not be translated into an electric vehicle. I don't think they're going to sell them for the same reason because it's effectively a utilitarian product. I think Tesla have got <clears throat> a sort of coolness to them and um, tech side, which is quite attractive. And I think, you know, there's Tata who will produce vehicles, utilitarian vehicles to suit a certain market. Um, so I think there's that's an example of a market where, frankly, there's never going to be any money in it ever. Uh, um, and and there's a, a in a market like that, then who actually wins in those markets? It's it's players like China, because those markets tend not to fit Western investment models. Um, whereas you oh, know, well, the, uh, uh, in India, in fact, uh, there are uh, uh, efforts driven to set up uh, battery manufacturing plants also here. There are already, uh, like I mentioned earlier, two companies which are got, getting started. They are into repurposing of batteries, right? You take yeah. the batteries from the cars and repurpose yeah. them to two wheelers because India is uh, the largest two wheeler market. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and electric uh, bikes, uh, motorbikes, electric yes. motorbikes are very big in India. Yeah, I know that. I, fact, think they're they're all, a, I think they're all good products. I think the, the other side of it actually is recycling. I think, again, uh, repurposing batteries is one thing. I don't think that's going to be hugely successful. I think the bigger, the bigger, more. Ch I think in some ways you're pushing the problem down the road, repurposing batteries. Um, and there's still significant problems with fire, fire risk with lithium batteries that the longer it goes on, the more chance there is of having a fire. So I think, you know, that there's a, there's a more pressing need to design batteries to be recycled. Oh no, we had some situation with some um, bikes catching fire, but it was more a design issue. It is true that lithium ion batteries get heated faster. So the design has to be such to make sure that they cool up faster as well. So the problem was more with the bike design. Uh, it was, yeah. uh, I think, was uh, Ola. There's I don't a... know. I think, I believe Ola is there in the uh, UK also now. Yeah, there's a fundamental problem with lithium lithium batteries though which is the dendrites that form across and short out and that that will always happen unless you create a um a layer which prevents that from happening there will always be right. short... so it was a design problem but they fixed it uh, uh, but yeah, yes, but there no, was this, an issue. no but th this isn't this isn't no there's a fundamental problem that's not well publicized which is 
the shorting out internally of batteries, which is a problem with the design and the process in electric, electric in lithium battery manufacture, which I've no, I have seen no evidence of that problem being satisfactorily solved, unless it's very expensive. You can do it using um, graphene, but it's just too prohibitively expensive. So there are some, there's some, so anyway, there's some, yeah, this, I think there's some challenges with the, uh, I think the bigger challenge is being able to recycle batteries, because the other thing that's going to happen is that lithium is going to run out. I've, again, I've done this. I figured out how much lithium there is on a planet and actually when's it going to run out. Um, and, um, you know, there's... Oh, uh, I don't know about it because, see, uh, I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, India found a huge uh, lithium base in uh, Jammu Kashmir, okay. the northern state. And uh, just uh, two days ago, there was a, uh, a huge... Uh, uh, source in Rajasthan as well, which is in the western border, touching Pakistan. Yeah. So, yeah, that's so good. You've got your India has got two huge deposits. So it looks like uh, India will become a one more source of lithium batteries. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, it's great you've in got the your next own few years. At least you won't be reliant on China, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, um, I think the other thing with this as well is ethics as well. Um, and I think what we're witnessing is, um, you know, the USA has always been the sort of policeman of the world. And the USA seems to have co completely collapsed from an ethical perspe perspective. And um, I think there's a that now I talked a bit about the economics. What the USA broadly have done is they've shut down their own oil manufacturer and they've started to import a lot of oil um, at huge cost to their balance of payments. Um, and um, whilst I'm, I quite like Trump. I'm not a pure, I'm by no means a puritanical um, fan of Trump whatsoever. But one of the points he makes is that if um, the USA had actually um, carried on developing, you know, developing their own oil reserves, they wouldn't have to import any oil. Now, there's this puritanical view that we need to just stop pumping oil, which is just disastrous. Because it, mm. And you can see the implications of that. It's causing an absolute... Well, part, in part, it's causing an absolute crisis from the inflation perspective, which is causing them to put the interest rates up, which is trashing their banking system. And now we have uh, two and a half trillions worth of uh, bad debt or value loss um, in the US, which is about 10 times the loss that took place in 2008. Right. So mm -hmm. I talked about the financial implications of this ideology. Right, we are witnessing that now. Okay, it's very real. Um, so, what I'm talking, and this is without even the infrastructure. We we're not putting any of the grid infrastructure Correct. in whatsoever. So, Correct. be beware of of this. Um, and I think you know, beware of ideology. Ideology, if if the viewers of this take take away nothing apart from this this one point, ideology creates tyranny, right? Because it becomes impossible to to argue against eventually. Um, well, your UK economy is significantly intertwined with US, right? So you will have a huge repercussion of uh, the American economy's uh, current situation, right? Well, the UK economy is, uh, yeah, is in real trouble, I think. Um, with it be I mean, if you just take the automotive industry, I mean, um, the automotive, there are certain critical industries. Automotive in the UK is critical. It employs 800,000 people. Um, and for the sake of our, our emissions are about 0.1% from vehicles globally. And mm. if we implement the zero carbon ideology in the UK, it saves about 0.001% of global emissions for the sake of 800,000 jobs in the UK. Nanju, mm. right. And... Um, for what benefit? Actually, I I don't think we're going to. I mean, one, we're not going to be able to afford those vehicles. When I look at it in the UK, for the reasons I've described. So, where would you focus on zero carbon if you were to do that? Not an automobile. Where else then? Yeah, I think um, the the first thing is to um, get some perspective on this, and I'll give you a biblical perspective to start off with, because hubris is a very big problem, right? Hubris. Um, and Jesus actually said, he said, look, you look after the planet and I'll fix the planet, right? 
Now, that is a very important delineation. And you may or may not be a Christian, I don't know. But it's a very important delineation that we look after the planet and so Jesus fixes the planet. Um, because the minute you start you thinking you can fix the planet, it's just, just beyond, comp it's just bizarre. You get involved in carbon capture, which is insane. If you look at carbon capture, we won't talk about that now, I hope, but it's utterly insane for a whole variety of reasons. Um, the first thing is to protect wealth, right, Nanju, right? So you've got to protect your economy mm -hmm. because unless you've got money to spend, right, and more money to spend, and it's more, not less, you're not going to be sure. able to afford this infrastructure and everything else, right? There's a few exceptions like Norway, which have got their own perfect power supply, hydroelectric and everything else in a very wealthy country. And the citizens are very wealthy, but mainly even in the UK, there's a very segmented population, probably not as extreme as India, but it's similar, where a lot of people would not be able to afford electric vehicles, right? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the capital expenditure or even the, the, you know, the, the running costs. So the first thing is to protect wealth. The second thing, I think, is to protect the natural systems, which we're not doing, like the rainforest. Um, and, you know, in the in the UK, there are peat bogs and other such things. We need to protect those. Those are the main source of absorbing carbon, um, as well as addressing the third on the list, I think, is probably China, um, taxing them for the 30 percent of carbon emissions, burning coal, which is just a monumental disaster, probably India, actually, as well. If most of your power comes from coal, that should be well, really... almost 47 percent is coal. Yeah. So that there ought to be some real focus on that. Um, I think the, the, the third one, which is related to the first one, is protecting economies from climate change. So take Bangladesh, which is below water sea level. If that economy it gets flooded or Pakistan, they get flooded quite frequently. Those people are not going to care about the environment until they've got somewhere they can live that their business doesn't get washed away every five minutes. So, right. the, and if you take Holland, actually, Holland is an example of this, um, where they have actually built sea defences, and they, it's almost impossible to live in Holland, you know, technically from a water sea level perspective. But that is a major source of money. So, effectively, what the UK government you know, should do specifically, for example, is invest in Bangladesh not in electric vehicles in the uk in my view right so that's okay. that's how bizarre you know in terms of priorities are messed up in my my estimation so countries with the money right should invest in the countries that don't have the money to support their economies right and and, and the other bizarre thing is to grow their economies they'll need more oil so during this period when you look at this you need more oil consumption to build the infrastructure because oil is a major raw material um and so that's a sort of top level perspective on uh what's going on um i think and you know within within that we've got the antithesis of that is really quite disturbing we've got the uk strategy which is centered around electric vehicles um hydrogen which is even worse than electric vehicles um which i, I can bore you with incessantly and carbon capture which is utterly insane so those are the Three technologies, all three of which will trash our. Oh economy. well, uh, uh, we had uh, Paul Martin. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, him. He's a Canadian. Uh, he is one of the biggest voices, loud voices against hydrogen in uh, automobiles. Yeah. So uh, we we had a podcast. So uh, I uh, think right. uh, I'd like to see that. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll, I'll share that. I urge the audience to look it up and. Uh, yeah. That's Go great. That. And also all the books uh, that Tom mentioned, we have the links for them below this podcast. So please do look up. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So if you take hydrogen, right, again, the psychology of it, green hydrogen, you know, and green hydrogen is not green because the, the energy has to come from somewhere, Nanju. Right. So right. if you look at it end to end, I think zero carbon is what matters. And actually, the model I use for EVs is just looking at energy full stop. Right. So then you can just then you can say, right, this is how much energy something consumes. And then you can ask the question, where does that energy come from? Right. Mm -hmm. And there's two, two separate issues. And then you've got level playing field. But when you start talking about green hydrogen, it doesn't, the, 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 you know, there's not enough power in the whole planet to produce hydrogen for a start. 
one of the big issues is is energy security, the cost of hydrogen. The cost of hydrogen currently is five times diesel. You know, it's just insane currently, and it's not going to come down because the physics of hydrogen um, is the physics of hydrogen. It's it requires. Do you know to cool to liquefy hydrogen? Do you know how what temperature you have to cool it to? Well, I I, I don't remember. It's yeah, minus, but it... it's minus two hundred and seventy degrees centigrade. Absolute zero when everything stops is minus 273, right? right? And they're bulky as well. Even after compression, it's still bulky. Yeah, exactly. So, and so voluminous, so it takes a lot of space. Yeah, still. and it costs it costs more to produce the electric vehicle. The carbon right. footprint and is the worse. conversion rate also gives you more, far lesser energy. Yeah, so exactly. It, uh, so it's, it's yep. just absurd. So the psychology of it, like green hydrogen, is very misleading. No, but uh, funnily, you mentioned Toyota. Toyota is betting big on hydrogen. Well, yes. Although I think um, Toyota are bigger on hybrids. I don't think I, I don't think hydrogen is going to work. I, it's very interesting. Uh, no, they are big on hybrid, of course. But now they are, their new CEO spoke about it that they are bit, betting big on uh, hydrogen vehicles. They have also initiated uh, thousand or twelve hundred hydrogen uh, uh, fueling uh, centers across Japan. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, they are start starting now because they are launching the car. They are doing a Corolla version of hydrogen, so they are actually mm -hmm. coming into economy segment. Yeah, so yeah. the current uh, model is Mirai, which is a premium segment. So they are yeah. coming with a Corolla, which which is going to be a economy version, and which they are also likely to bring to India next, naturally, because India is the biggest yeah, market. Yeah. And uh, Indian uh, Minister for Road Transport is talking big about hydrogen. Yeah. So. Well, I think uh, so I, I don't know how uh, I'll just the say, whole realistic. It's quite possible that I mean I've seen this. So it's quite possible that even companies like Toyota can be completely usurped with ideology, okay, and governments. This is what we're witnessing at the moment. So I'm not. There's a separate discussion to to look through that. I have looked at it a, a bit about what Toyota are doing with hydrogen, but I, from what I understand, from for the perspectives of total energy, total energy, right amount of energy to create hydrogen versus energy out where does that energy come from um it and storage and a whole you know the cost of them it's 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 worse than electric vehicles but maybe we park for that um for the moment I, again i think i agree in terms of nuclear power i think that's absolutely critical um there's been a lot of lobbying against nuclear power but all of a sudden it's it's the most sen sensible thing that's going on at the moment Sea power, I think, is um, underutilized. Wind, lesser so. I don't think we really want to cover when the. When you say sea, you mean tidal? Tidal, yeah. Sorry, tidal power. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wind, I don't think we want to cover the whole planet with windmills or solar panels. Uh, so. Any thoughts on this blue hydrogen, as they refer to it? It's no, uh, the it's, methane in the sea. Methane what, in the sea and. Well, yeah. Um, blue hydrogen, yeah. I mean, I. I um, when I started zero carbon, uh, we took methane and we cracked it to hydrogen and high high value, uh, high spec graphene. Um, that process is quite interesting because what you get is you get roughly the th the same thermal value of, um, you get the same thermal value more or less less about ten percent by converting the methane to hydrogen, um, so you can burn that, but it burns. Um, it burns, doesn't burn like gas. It, hydrogen explodes. It, it go, it's like no, but there is a there is a, there is some school of thought of there some set of people who talk about blue hydrogen is better than green hydrogen. So, from well, that respect, well, it, let me just explain. But the way to give an idea of the hybrid aspect of this to make this work, you have to use the um, you have to use the graphene for something productive to reduce consumption. So, one of the main things you can do is materials engineering to make things last longer. So when I said, mm. um, so you put graphene in concrete, for example, um, and you use less concrete, um, but you're going to charge more money for it because what, what happens when you put graphene in concrete, it nucleates around the graphene molecules and it, it, it actually sets faster and it's stronger. Mm -hmm. So you can actually reduce, and concrete is a really, it's 8% of global CO2 is concrete, um, well, through making cement. Um, so that's a really big issue. Um, and there's no real replacement for cement 
that anybody's found. So the materials engineering aspect of it is really important. So, um, and that feeds into reducing consumption, but also charging more for things. So beware, all of these things require a business model change. So if you're selling concrete in that way, you, you know, you've got to type, you have to sell it. You know, it's, it's antithesis what you were saying in terms of your blockchain, give it away. You've got to have somebody um, actually buy it for more money. And obviously with tires as well, you can put graphene in tires, they last longer, but somebody's going to have to pay more for tires. Have you got, are you going to spend 250 pounds per tire or a thousand pounds when your car, you might only keep your car for two years or I don't know, whatever. But so these are real big. So when you start changing, I mean, an aerospace industry is very good at materials engineering, making things last forever. So right. the point I'm making is when you, this is an example, you know, I was talking about the hybrid strategy, Nanju, right. and in, in its entirety. It does, but you have to use the offtake, both both offtakes, the hydrogen and the graphene, to make the over the overall system work. Uh, otherwise, you otherwise it's net. It's about net percent loss in energy, net ten percent loss in energy. Um, so, right. um, that's about that's one fairly useful bit of technology. But most of this technology doesn't really make that much difference to zero carbon. I think the main things we should be doing is protecting our economies. Um, reducing consumption, um, protecting third world economies which are affected by um, climate change. They're really the things we must do. Um, and, uh, you know, taxing, you know, penalising people who burn, you know, China who burn coal um, and and also India, I'm afraid to say as well. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think and, and UK government strategy, you talked about Toyota strategy being all over the place. I think UK government strategy is all over the place because EVs, hydrogen, uh, carbon capture is just... Um, is very well, even UK is talking about hydrogen? What was that, sorry? UK is also talking about hydrogen? Oh, yeah. UK is very big on hydrogen, yeah. Um, okay. it's, it's bonkers. Oh, yeah, you have some buses powered by hydrogen. Hydrogen cell powered bus. Yeah, yeah. But there's right, a right. there's a lot of investment into companies. The UK is well, quite good. Even at here, Tata's have launched a hydrogen cell powered buses. Uh, I think uh, somewhere in India, uh, yeah. it was flagged off by the very same minister I mentioned. So yeah, uh, they're talking about more hydrogen cell powered buses in India as well. Yeah, there are some very limited as no applications for hydrogen where I think it's worthwhile. One is heating steel, because what it does is it break because it explodes. It doesn't burn. It breaks up the surface tension, improves the conductivity when you're heating steel. Um, but everything else, it's a pain. It leaks. It leaks. It's impossible to store. Um, it's very expensive to produce. It's very expensive to buy. It's not secure as a supply source. And anything that you no, know, the the hydrogen fuel cells are very expensive to make. Um, and you know they they don't achieve they don't achieve that zero carbon utopia. They actually create quite a lot of well, not quite a lot of pollution. It can, probably can. That's probably something that can be improved on. But they do also create pollution. They don't just produce water. Um, mm. So I think the thing to watch with this as well is that from doing from these strategies we're talking about, it's very important that we level up the wealth divide as well. So um, the the difficulty with with having a a uh, sort of a big wealth divide is that you create tyranny because when when one part of the you know, population becomes um, less wealthy and the other part of the population becomes more wealthy and that disparity improves, the only way to control the people who haven't got money is is you know, democracies get usurped by that. So the, the importance of creating jobs and wealth at all levels throughout society is absolutely critical. And I think for sure China... China's view of the Industrial Revolution 4 is very narrow, which is to control the population. Um, and that's something that you know, we really need to fight against, in my view.